Asatoma Sakamaya Tamasoma Joyti Gamaya Mrityoma Amritam Gamaya Om Sabisham Swasti Bhavatu Sabisham Shanti Bhavatu Sabisham Ponam Bhavatu Sabisham Mangalam Bhavatu Loka samasta suki no bhavantu Om triumbakam yajamahe sugandim pushti vadanam Ova rukami vabandanat mritya mukhiyam amritat Om Shanti 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 Om Peace 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 Bring your hands into Anjali Mudra by your head. Offer your practice today to a nature being, a place that you enjoy, a place that inspires you. And bring that holy place into your mind's eye. And dedicate your practice to that place. Namaste. So, we continue with the life story of Tirumali Krishnamacharya. So, last week we um, got to the story of Nathamuni and uh, his apparition to Krishnamacharya and how that kind of set him on the course for the rest of his sort of yogic life. And if you did weren't here and you missed that, um, if you want to catch up with the story of Krishnamacharya, I put it on WhatsApp group. So you can listen to the that part. So what's happened now is Krishnamacharya's had this vision. He's been inspired and he's had the Yoga Rahasya uh, revealed to him by the Saint Nathamuni. And then he goes back to Mysore, which is his hometown. And he um, enrolls again in the Parakala Math there, which is the sort of uh, college there. And he does a few more kind of um, qualifications and degrees. And then he gets this idea that he needs to go to Varanasi to study. So Varanasi is like the Cambridge or the Oxford of India. It's where all the major universities are and where the most uh, important teachers are. So he gets permission from the head of the Parakalamath in Mysore, who is actually his grandfather, and he heads to Varanasi. And he signs up with several of the universities there and takes several different courses. And he sort of does really well. And he gets to know some of the principals of the colleges um, really well. And along with his studies, one of the other things he does there is he starts to teach yoga, teach Hatha yoga. So he teaches Hatha yoga to some of his uh, professors and also to their families, to their children. So he's beginning to teach yoga at this point, Hatha yoga, but it's a Hatha yoga that was taught to him by his father. And then when he's in Varanasi, he obviously meets lots of people there. He's moving in the circles of yogis and pandits and scholars. And he meets a saint. Um, and this saint is a Hatha yogi as well. And he says, asks him where he can go in India to study Hatha yoga, like a level that he wants to learn it at. And someone who could really explain to him the yoga sutras. And the saint tells him there's nobody left in India like that. If you want to find this person, you need to go to Tibet. And so he tells him about this person who's called Rama Mahana Brahmachari. And he says, this is the person that you need to find. He's the only person that can teach you what you need to know. Because you've got to remember that Krishnachari was already at a very high level in his studies. And he needed a master to teach him. So then he gets this idea in his head that he's got to go to Tibet. And it's not easy to get to Tibet. <laughs> it's not easy to get the papers to be able to go to Tibet. So this is where this part of the story really starts. And I'm not sure I actually need to read it. Um, so 
what happens is uh, he he writes a letter to the local, not not to the local, but to the governor of the of the railways, and the governor of the railways is really impressed with him and really impressed with his qualifications and his sincerity for yoga, and so he offers him this pass, free pass that allows him to travel anywhere he wants to go at any time in India on the train, <laughs> which is really nice. <laughs> so like there's this sort of um, interest in what he's doing. And so he gets a letter from his principal of his college, which introduces him to the Viceroy of India. And the Viceroy of India at that time is Lord Harding. So I think you all know what a Viceroy is. Yeah, He's a colonial uh, overlord of the whole country. And so these are the kind of circles that Krishmacharya is moving in, like high level scholars and people who are in positions of power. Um, so he is armed with this letter. He gets away from the university. They allow him to go. He gets on the train. He goes to Shimla. So Shimla is like the summer residence of the Viceroy of India because they go there because it's cool. And um He's going there to get the passes that he needs to go to Tibet. And the Viceroy is the only person who can really give him these papers. So when he gets there, he finds out the Viceroy has got diabetes and he's really unwell. And he has to really wait until the Viceroy is well enough to be able to see him. And this goes on for a while. And then he gets a message from the Viceroy. Fortunately, the doctor of the Viceroy at that time was the son of Ganganath Jha, who was his main teacher in Varanasi, in the main university there. And so this connection brings Krishmacharya into the Viceroy's presence. So that this young doctor, he asked Krishmacharya to visit the Viceroy and see if he can help him with any Ayurveda on yoga practice. And so he has this audience with the Viceroy and the Viceroy basically asks him what he knows about yoga and Krishmacharya says something like, I don't know everything I need to know about yoga, but I know enough to teach foreigners. <laughs> so the Viceroy sort of says, OK, fair enough. Right. So and he starts um, learning um, Hatha Yoga and Pranayama predominantly from Krishmacharya. And also, you've got to remember that Ayav uh, he was also an Ayurvedic physician, uh, Krishmacharya. So he's treating him with herbs and with remedies. And he's also teaching him Hatha Yoga and teaching him pranayama. Within six months, the Viceroy is, I'm not saying he's completely recovered, but he's like really well again. And he puts this down to the efforts of Krishmacharya learning yoga. And so he's really, really pleased with Krishmacharya. And so he says to Krishmacharya, what do you want as a reward for your service? And Krishmacharya says, I want to go to Tibet. And he says, fine. He gives him the papers that he needs to get out of the country and go to Tibet. And he provides him with to a guide and an aide to accompany him and like pack animals. And he gives him the supplies and the money to do the trip. That's how impressed he was with Krishmacharya. So it's like a, a really big moment for Krishmacharya. And he says to him, you can go and do this. I will, I will help you get to Tibet and meet your teacher, this teacher. But, um, in return, you must come back from Tibet once every three months and spend a bit of time with me so I can continue with my yoga practice. And so he becomes a personal teacher of the Viceroy of India. And he does honor that. Even when he's studying in Tibet, he keeps coming back for the Viceroy once a year. Uh, what, once, what was it once every year? Anyway, it was maybe, I think it was something like once every six months he had to come back for a couple of weeks or something. I can't remember exactly. Maybe I should have read the book. <laughs> but I think you're getting the general idea, yeah? And so what happens next is he takes this trip and it's about 250, 210, 220 miles of walking through the Himalayas. And it's very, very difficult terrain. Even today, it's a tr real trek. But then... It was like a really difficult trek. And this is why he needed the guides. But Krishmacharya just kept going. He was all, if he was, he was very determined. And he made this trek and he went, he arrived in um, Tibet 
and he arrives on the lakes. He's told that this this teacher, Rama, uh, Rama Mahana Brahmachari, lives around this lake called Manasaravar. And the Manasaravar lake is like a sacred lake. It's the highest freshwater lake in the world in the Himalayas. And it's kind of like it's a lake that is underneath Mount Kailash. And so my, Mount Kailash is that sort of dome-shaped uh, mountain, which is the abode of Shiva. So it's a sacred mountain and in it for yogis and Hindus. And the lake underneath is said to represent uh, Parvati. So this is like the Shiva and the Shakti, it's a very sacred place. So Parvati and Shiva, this is their domain, their realm. And very powerful place for pilgrimage. But it's also a very important place for Buddhists. So around the lakes, the shores of the lake, which is a few miles across, there's lots of Buddhist temples as well. So there's the shrines to Shiva and stuff, and then there's the Buddhist temple, a big pilgrimage place, very sacred, important place. And so Krishmacharya gets there, and a long, exhausting journey, but he doesn't rest. He just has to find his teacher. And eventually he finds this, he goes to this cave and at the entrance to the cave, it says, he said, there's a, a tall yogi with a long beard, like an ascetic. And he said, the moment he saw him, before he even asked what his name was, he knew that was his teacher. So he prostrates before the teacher and says, will you teach me? And it's a classic thing that, in the Indian teaching style, basically, it's like, mm, don't know. <laughs> you know, he said, well, you know, well, why have you come all the way to Tibet? Why have you walked all the way to Tibet? You know, he must have known that he was fairly uh, uh, keen. And um, so Krishmacharya starts to talk to him and he talks to him in Sanskrit, in fluent Sanskrit. So it's kind of, he can immediately see that this is a really serious student. And he decides to test him. So first of all, he shows him around the lake and takes him back to his place and uh, he, gives, he gives him tea and fruit and that kind of stuff. And then the aides disappear. They go back. They start their trek back to Shimla. And Krishmachara is left there on his own with a teacher. And inside the cave is the teacher's wife. He's married and he has three children. So he meets the family. And then he gives him eight days of where he is only allowed to eat fruit. And he just teaches him pranayama for eight days, all different pranayama techniques. And this is his kind of trial period. And at the end of the eight days, he says, yes, I accept you as a student. Um, because in India, there's this sort of thing that the teacher traditionally would always test the student before they took them on. Because obviously the teacher doesn't want to waste their own time, but they also don't want to waste the time of the student. If the student isn't ready or the student isn't suitable for that teacher, they try to find that out as quickly as they can. And then they kind of say, OK, no, this is not going to work. Go away. <laughs> and Krishmacharya was, is well known for doing that to many of the people who approached him. They had to kind of they had to sort of like prove they really wanted to be taught. So he kept up that. Mm, kind of idea right so he learns uh, Pranayama is accepted as a student and then he lives in the cave with his teacher and the family for eight years so well nearly seven and a half a bit more years studying exclusively with Rama, Brahama, Rama, Rama Mahana Brahmachari one-to-one, -one, no other students, for seven and a half to eight years. He takes his little trips back to Shimla to teach the Viceroy, but apart from that, it's exclusively there studying. And he studies Hatha Yoga mainly. He studies in depth the Yoga Sutras, Bhagavad Gita, uh, and the Yoga Karunta, which is a now lost text. And he along with the hatha yoga techniques he learns he learns extensive pranayama techniques he learns about vinyasa the kind of vinyasa we're doing here and he also learns yoga chiksa which is yoga therapy like the therapeutic use of yoga um, for healing which is very interlinked with ayurveda ayurveda 
So all those things he's learning there for seven years along with the scriptures. And you've got to remember, there's no pens, there's no paper, there's no tablets, there's nothing to record. It's all done by recitation and memory. So it's done through sutras and through physical practice. Because this teacher was a, an adept. He was an adept Hatha yogi. And so he taught direct Krishmachara directly these yogic postures and techniques. Krishmachara does that for seven and a half, eight years. I mean, can you imagine living in a cave in the Himalayas with your teacher for seven and a half to eight years and just doing it every day? And don't think about doing it with me. <laughs> Anybody want to come to the cabin for seven and a half years? Uh, you know, I would run out of things to teach you after about the end of the first week. So this is like a, a real, this is a rare thing that would never really happen. Maybe it can happen. And maybe those people are there. Who knows? If you knew where to look, would they be there? Maybe there are some, but they're not on Instagram. You know what I mean? So, but this teacher was there and he was the only teacher that could teach what Krishmacharya needed because Krishmacharya needed to reinvigorate a lost tradition. Because what happens is he does this study with his teacher and then at the end of the study, there's a the study, the teacher will eventually say, now I finished teaching you. There's nothing more I need to teach you. Now you have to offer me Dakshina. And Dakshina means uh, payment. So you have to pay me now. You have so and so the payment can be all sorts of things. It can be a cow. It depends on the status and the wealth of the student or the family, it could be a cow, it could be a house, it could be um, a buffalo, it could be many different things, but often it's a task. And in Krishmacharya's case, it was a task. So he said to Krishmacharya, go back to India, marry, have a family and become a yoga teacher. <laughs> which is about the worst job in India at that time, 1920s, mid-1920s, 19, early 1920s. Nobody was interested in yoga. There wasn't, that culture didn't exist. There were people practicing yoga in their personal daily rituals and doing sun salutations and puja and all that kind of thing. But physical hatha yoga had virtually died out. And so what he did was he gave this high caste Brahmin, priestly caste, Indian, who was well enough qualified to have a top job or be the principal of any of the major universities in India, he gave him the lowliest job. He said, go home and teach people yoga. But of course, this is what Krishmacharya wanted to do. This is why he'd studied all this time. He wanted to do that, but there was no kind of um, infrastructure for it at that time. So what happens is he agrees to this Dakshina. He goes back to Mysore, his family, he marries, and then he can't earn a living. Nobody wants to practice yoga. So he takes a job in a coffee plantation, working on the land, working, picking, you know, picking and processing coffee beans because he only way can earn any money. And then What happens next? <laughs> I'll tell you next week. <laughs> because this is where the story of what, how yoga sort of like develops and spreads and kind of like comes to the West and everything that happens almost like from that point. From the point of being in a very difficult situation to finding a way of teaching and finding a way and gathering students around him and then becoming the yoga master genius that he was. Um, and I don't know if any of you remember when you saw that film, some of you seen Breath of the Gods, I've showed it a couple of times, um, which is about the life of Krishna. It's pretty flawed, actually, that film. There's lots of misinformation in it, but it's an interesting, nice watch. Have most of you seen that, I take it? called Breath of the Gods. I think you can watch it. It's on YouTube, isn't it? It might be on YouTube. I think it is. 
look it up, Breath of the Gods. It's got a really nice soundtrack because the guy who made the film, he films opera. So the whole soundtrack is opera. It works really well. And um, But there's a bit in that which I really remember where they're interviewing one of his daughters and she was saying like, uh, oh, what was it, everybody, like, what was it like growing up with Krishmacharya, you know, like great yoga teachers known all over the world that's had all this influence. And she basically said, oh, it was really embarrassing. Like, because like she wouldn't tell her friends at school that her father was a yoga teacher because she would be really looked down on for that. It was only later he became famous and it was something they could be proud of. But for a long time, it was something they, you know, the family were kind of like the children, you know what, the kids are like, you know, they, 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 were, they, were, they, were, they were ashamed of Krishmacharya's profession. They knew what he was doing, but they knew other people wouldn't understand. It's quite interesting how things have changed. So next week, I'll tell you what happens next. Oh, one of the things that's nice in this little book, this is um, Krishmacharya's grandson's book, Kasta Jessica Char. Jessica Char was a son, Kasta was a grandson. And um, in this book, he says, Kasta says that uh, when Krishmacharya came back from Tibet, the only things he brought with him were the teachings, which were in his head, um, and a pair of his teacher's wooden sandals, which is traditional in India, that's something you bow to the feet of the guru, so you, they would be used for him to worship. And some drawings of the asana practice that the daughter of Rama Mahana Brahmachari had made for him. And these are the drawings. So they were made in the cave, like obviously, not these ones, but you know, like these drawings were made in the cave in Tibet by his teacher's daughter, and Krishmacharya bought a series of these home with him to remind him, or maybe like souvenirs, because I don't know if he needed reminded of the practice, but they're just doing shooting bow, Arkana Dhanarasana, and uh, uh, Masi Andrasana, spinal twist, in half lotus, not Ada, but Purna. And, um, and then on the next page, which is another subject all to itself, which you might have to come and look at this later because it's quite a small one. It's a reproduction of um, two yogis doing yoga, but using props. And so the props are, well, this one is like a, a rope hanging from the ceiling and the yogi's laying in the rope, like in a flat position. And this one is a yogi climbing a rope. Now, maybe that's not what you would expect him to be learning in a cave in the Himalayas. But, uh, can I get into this? No, no, I can't take too long. Um, yeah, next week, next week. So yeah, that's an interesting thing that these drawings that actually came out of that cave with his teacher, those drawings, they're, they're using props in yoga. Now, people always think this is a much later addition to yoga. And also the whole idea of vinyasa. A lot of people think that vinyasa didn't, wasn't really invented till much later. But the whole idea of the vinyasa and of using props, because they're used often for therapeutic reasons as well, and Krishmachara talks about this in his little book, Yoga Makaranda, um, they were being, he was being taught this by his teacher in the Himalayas. Interesting. A lot of people in uh, yogic academia have big arguments about all this stuff. Interesting. Okay, stand up, come to the center of your mat. Turning into the asana. Chest up, chin down, look hard, OJ breathing.
in how wide and overhead. Pause at the top. Exhale, widen down. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Arch back, separate the palms, big circle. Inhale. Chin down, look hard as you lift, keep the length. Exhale forward and wide. Pause, get a bit more air out of the lungs. Banders. Release banders, inhale. <coughs> exhale. Do that vinyasa one more time. Palms down, head up. <clears throat> Gaze stays in the heart throughout. Inhale, widen overhead. Exhale, hands into Pristanjali Mudra, reverse prayer behind your back. Or interlock the fingers, palms facing, or hold the elbows. Inhale, lift and open your chest. Hold the breath, arch back. And Tarkumbaka, internal retention. Push the heart up. Exhale, stand up. Inhale, fill the lungs. Hold the breath wow. back. So just bring your hands down and then lock your fingers if you like. Like that. And then do one more. If you got your hands in prayer behind your back, try to use your hands to push your heart up. Keep a gaze on the tip of your nose so you don't lose your balance. And inhale, widen overhead. And then Tadasana. So Namaskar. Inhale. Exhale. Anjali Mudra. <clears throat> Om Mitre Namaha. Om Ravi Namaha.
ओम सुरे नमहा ओम बनवे नमहा ओम खगे नमहा ओम पुष्णि नमहा ओम हिरणीय गे नम ओम मरीचे नम ओम मरीचे नम ओम सवित्रे नम ओम अखे नम ओम भास्कर नम Turn to the side. Inhale, raise the arm. Exhale, hop a step. Inhale, arms over the head. Turn the feet to the right for warrior one. Square the hips. Front foot to the right, Helen. Inhale, arch back. Exhale, bend the knees, sweep the arms. Don't lean forward. Inhale. Straighten the leg, arch back, but keep looking at the horizon line. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Hold three breaths. Keep the back leg nice and straight. Ground the outside of the back foot. Hand shoulder distance apart. Tailbone drops, lower abdomen in and up. When you've done your three breaths, You arch back with this time with the front knee bent, pushing the left hip forward. You are when you arch back and this final time you want to just hold that breath in for a little while, feel the stretch, and then exhale to the floor, hands down. Inhale, raise the back leg. <clears throat> Get everything strong. Next, inhale, arms back beside your hips, or yeah, just do that for a start. We'll do some variations here. Just extend your arms straight back, close to your body, palms facing your thighs. And then if you if you've got the space, then inhale, bring the arms out like wings. It feels nice, like a bird. If you really press down into your standing foot, it feels a bit like you're flying. And then on the next inhale, bring the arms over your head in prayer. Or do what you can. <laughs> and then inhale. Now inhale, bring your arms back like wings. This is the vinyasa. <laughs> and then inhale. Exhale. And then inhale, bring your arms back to your sides. So it challenges your balance, which is what it's for. And then inhale and exhale, bring your back foot down where it was. Flip your palms, inhale, come up, arch back to the front leg straight. And exhale, Trikonasana Stiti, turn to the side, arm shoulder level. Inhale, arms overhead, 
switch your feet to the left. And then do two vinyasas, third time hold. When you arch back, don't look up at the ceiling. You look at the horizon, Taraka. Holding for three breaths. If you drop your shoulder blades down, you'll be able to straighten your arms more. Your shoulders come up, your elbows will bend. You want your shoulders down so you can get the breath high in the lungs. You want your right hip forward. When you come up, front knee stays bent on the final time. Keep moving through the vinyasa, just do whatever variations you're working on and don't rush, use your breath length. And then you move on inhale, so you move to the bird or airplane on inhale. And exhale, then the overhead prayer on inhale and then you move back in the same way. That's too much, you can just work on whatever you need to. Really keep pushing into the standing foot so you feel light, so you feel that like you're floating like a bird. <laughs> you can even flap your wings if you really feel like it. Beautiful. And then Trikonasana Stiti. That's nice. That's a nice vinyasa. Turn the right foot out, the left foot in, lengthen your stance six inches. Drop your hands behind you and lock your fingers with the arms straight, palms facing. Humble warrior. Right foot turned out totally, left foot turned in slightly. So Trikonasana stance with the hips facing the side, not warrior one stance. Hips facing long side of the mat. Front foot in line with knee. Inhale. Exhale, bend the front knee through the center of the foot. And drop the torso down and bring the right shoulder just inside the right knee. And bring the head down just inside the instep of the right foot. Bring the arms over gently and gaze at the back heel so there's no tension in your neck. Good. And then bend the front knee a little bit more. Inhale, come up. Exhale, switch the feet and go straight down over the left side. Just go inside the knee. That's an important thing. And so you can keep your shoulders more square, you don't twist your torso too much. Get all the breath out, looking at the back heel, no tension in the neck, inhale, come up. Switch the feet, exhale to the right. I'm gonna hold here for two breaths. You can probably bend the front knee more than you think you can. Sarah, you need to move your front foot to the left and lengthen your stance. Completely relax your neck and just bring the shoulder down inside the leg. 
And then when you're ready, you come up and switch sides and two breaths on the other side. <clears throat> You want a, a good strong Udhyana Banda here, and you want to keep working down into the back leg so you can push the front knee forward and keep stable. But you're too far away from the knee. You know, no, no, it just peaks. It just wants to be such very touching, but very lightly. That's, when you've done your two breaths, make your way up and we'll meet in Trikonasana Stiti. And then exhale, hop or step your feet together. <clears throat> Inhale. And then slowly lower your arms to complete the vinyasa. And then turn to face the front. Yeah, I'm absolutely fascinated by the fact that Krishnamacharya was probably doing this with his teacher in a cave in the, Himal in the Himalayas in Tibet. And he was going, no, don't lower your arms yet. You have to wait to the exhale and then lower your arms. Don't be impatient. <laughs> or something like that. Inhale, widen overhead, flip your palms. Exhale, palms forward. Inhale, arch back. And exhale, fold all the way. Inhale, exhale, Ukatasana. Inhale, Chaturanga Dandasana. Inhale, Udva Mukhasranasana. Exhale, Adam Three breaths. Exhale is twice the length of the inhale is optional banders. Do it with your breath length. When you finish the three breaths, then you come forward into plank and lower slowly to the floor. Bring the hands back beside your hips. Take rest. Stronger legs here, don't bend your knees in Chaturanga. Turn the head to one side and rest. Switch off Uji breathing. Your hands under your shoulders for Bhujangas and Cobra. Forehead on the floor, close your eyes. Roll your eyes up and look at your third eye. Forehead on the floor. Allison. Good. And then exhale there. Can't you bring your hands back a bit more? Inhale, lift your forehead, your nose, your chin, your chest. Looking up, rolling the eyes in. Pause. Exhale, slowly down. Control descent with the breath. Inhale up. Hold. Exhale, bend the knees, bring the heels towards the buttocks. And keep the feet knees together if you can. Inhale, straighten the legs to the floor. And as they touch the floor, lift your chest a little higher. Exhale slowly down. That's the vinyasa. You do that two more times. Keep the eyes rolled up. Inhale, come up. Not the legs yet. The legs come on the exhale. Exhale, bend the knees. Squeeze feet down towards the buttocks. 
pause. Inhale, straighten the legs to the floor. And come up a bit higher. Move your heart forward. Push forward, forward, forward with the heart. And then exhale slowly down. Do that one more time on your own. When you get the heels in towards the buttocks, you just want to pause there at the end of the exhale and squeeze the legs down a little bit. Like some of the sacral region. And then when the legs go straight, just drag your heart forward like a cobra. Bujanga, cobra. And exhale slowly down. Inhale, low cobra. Exhale, seat the heels, counter pose, long back. Knees together, hands on the floor, take a breath. Turn the toes under, downward facing dog. Inhale to plank pose. Exhale slowly through Chaturanga to the floor. Keep your form in Chaturanga, like we talked about last week. And then when you go through, just go through smoothly to the floor. Good. Bring your hands back beside your hips. Bend both knees and get the tops of the feet. Keep your knees close together. And then draw your feet down outside your hips. So your feet are going towards the floor for Bekasana. Hands are on the tops of the feet. Or if you can pivot your hands round so the fingers point in the same direction of the toes, you can. But um, you need to have your feet down a fair way to do that. And your elbows would then go up. And then exhale there. Squeeze the heels down. We need to be slightly outside the hips so you have an internal hip rotation. And then as you inhale, lift the head and the chest up and squeeze the feet down. And exhale, come down. Just do some more cobras, Jane. And inhale, come up, push the feet down. And exhale, come down. Inhale, don't move. Nangana Kriya. Hold the tops of the feet, hither. Exhale, come up. And this time, hold, take a deep inhale, and then come down again on the exhale. And when you get down there, keep hold of the feet and just squeeze the feet down a little bit more till the heels touch. So your feet need to be wider, Julie. They've got to be able to touch the floor outside your hips eventually. So there. Yeah, and Julie, your knees are too far apart, so you're twisting your hips too much. And then bring your hands under your shoulders, release the feet, do a low cobra, and exhale, seat the heels long back, downward facing dog. Inhale, come forward into plank pose, and exhale, lower chaturanga. Move through the vinyasa to downward facing dog. Take a deep inhale and downward facing dog. A uh, very long exhale so your lungs are empty. Hold the breath out. Hop a step forward into Vajrasana, landing on the shins. Just halfway down your mat will do. Bring your hands onto the tops of your knees. Chest up, chin down, look heart, eyes closed, UJ breathing. Inhale, sit up on the knees, sweep the arms, interlock the fingers, lift up. Exhale, thumbs to the back of the neck, seat to the heels. Go all the way down and keep exhaling till there's nothing left. Draw your elbows back strongly. Hold the breath out, banders.
release bandas. Sit up, inhale, push the hands to the ceiling. Exhale, sit down, hands to the knees. Keep the seat on the heels. Inhale, arms over the head, flip your palms. Exhale, fold forward, palms to the floor. And to the lungs. Separate the palm, hands, palms to the floor. Flip the palms, inhale, come up. Exhale, go forward, arms wide like wings and bring the hands down so they just hover half an inch off the floor. You want to be able to feel the floor but not touch the floor. Inhale, come up. Inflock the hands over your head, lift. Exhale, hands behind you. Interlock the fingers, palms together, arms straight. Hold the opposite elbow, our hands in reverse prayer. On the inhale, arch back, look up. Exhale, fold forward. Bring the forehead to the floor. And the elbows up if you're in prayer or the arms up if you're interlocked. Hold the breath out. And then inhale, come up and arch back. Push the heart up. Exhale, release the hands. Inhale, bring the arms over your head. Exhale, hands behind you 10 inches. Lean to the hands, squeeze the shoulder blades. Inhale, lift the hips. Push the shins down, push the feet down, let the head go back. Exhale, come down. Stay there a minute. Come onto your back. Come onto your back. And do bridge pose here. So put your feet together, your hands beside your body, and come up and down doing that back bend, yeah? And exhale, come down. So now we can, can do this and hold for a few breaths, or I'll give you a variation. If you're comfortable there and you want to go down onto your elbows, go down onto your elbows and take hold of your heels and bring the top of your head to the floor. You keep the heels under the body. Good. And then on the inhale, lift the hips up. Head back. Exhale down. And if you're comfortable in that posture on your elbows, you can bring your hands over as if you're going to do a wheel. And on the next time, you can lift up the whole body into diamond pose. And inhale, come up. And this time, hold for breath. Inhale. Exhale slowly down. And then inhale, make your way up in the arms of your head. And exhale, keep the fingers interlocked and bring the hands just below your navel, above your pubic bone. Inhale. Fully exhale, fold all the way down. So you feel the pressure on your internal organs. And then inhale, keep the abdomen down, but lift the head and the chest up and look forward. Head and chest up, look forward. And then close your eyes and look third eye, roll the eyeballs up. Exhale. Normal inhale, keep your head up, keep looking forward. And the more you look up, press down more for your abdomen. And then a very long exhale. Looking forward, but with the eyes closed, hold the exhale, lift Ashwini Mudra, lift strongly through the anus. Look up, draw the prana from the pelvic floor to the third eye. Do that one more breath. So you're making the retention 
at the end of the exhale. Bear Kumbhaka. Your head's not on the floor here. You're looking forward. And then when you're finished, release the bandha and inhale, come up. Sweep the arms over your head. Exhale, put the hands on the floor. Hop or step back, Chaturanga. Inhale, upward facing dog. Exhale, downward facing dog. Hold the breath out, hop or step forward. Bukatasana, squat down. Inhale, strain your legs. Exhale, Uttanasana, fold into the legs. Flip your palms, inhale, come up. Chin down, look hard. Exhale, Tadasana. Inhale. Ujjayi breathing, please. Exhale, palms forward. Inhale, arch back. Bring your knees. Exhale, fold. Move through the vinyasa until you get to down dog and then hold. Death breaths and down to hold. Dumbakasan, bring your right knee forward in between your hands. That's your foot, Caroline. <laughs> the knee is a bit halfway up. I don't know why everybody, yeah, okay, knee halfway forward between your hands. <laughs> and then bring the other knee forward and put it right behind. So your knees are near your hand. It wants to be in the middle of the mat. So everybody go back. Set up for Guma We did this last week, didn't we? No? Come on. You're kidding me. Did we? Uh, did we miss this last week? Okay, I'll talk you through it and we'll see what happens. It could be interesting. Okay, so Andy, this is not going to be for you. You're just going to, I'll give you a different variation in a minute. Inhale, bring the right knee right in the middle of the mat between your hands. Bring the foot across so it's in line with the outside of your uh, left hip. You put across. Yeah, now bring the other knee forward and mm, snuggle it in really tight behind the front knee. So they're like really close and snuggled together. And then bring both feet apart and sit back between your heels or on a block or on the floor if you're comfortable. And have both feet sticking out to the sides with the soles of the feet pointing up like little horns. So Andy, you're going to, we're doing this a spinal twisting variation. So you're going to be doing the seated spinal twist with one leg straight and then your right knee over to the outside of that straight leg. And that's the same for anybody else. Jane, 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 Jane. <laughs> do me a favor and don't kill yourself. But just sit down and do the straight leg of twist. It will be more than plenty, plenty. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to, yeah, you don't, you need to be able to get out of it if you get into it, kind of helps. You should sit on a block, Andy. Okay, so if you are comfortable there, start with the hands on the soles of the feet, turning the tops of the feet down and pressing the feet down so the shins rotate forward as much as possible. It's a good start. And, and when you do that, if you just wriggle a little bit and kind of get your sit bones seated and your knees really kind of like as engaged as possible, then that will help what comes next. Inhale, sweep the arms over the head. You'll still be doing that variation. Yeah. Exhale, turn to the right. Okay, and then bring the right hand down behind you. Sweep it across your back and hold onto your right big toe. 
and bring the left hand across the front of the body and hold on to your left big toe. Now, and then inhale, lift your chest. Hold on to it. You can hold the foot if you can't hold the big toe. And then exhale, twist and look over your right shoulder. And how are you getting on holding your toes? So the yes, why you have a strap. Okay, so just stop a minute and look to the front. I'll just help here so you can see. So this is where you bring the strap. You bring it under the foot. And if you can get a, a bind on that, on, on the side, hand that's going behind you, can you put the strap over? You can use that to help your twist. And as you twist, don't bother about a strap on your other foot, but you bring your uh, left arm across and keep moving it towards your left foot. You know what I'm saying? So that strap's gonna help you. Inhale, lift the chest and exhale, twist. If you could, the full posture would be holding both big toes, but if you can just hold the feet, that's something. If you can't hold anything, it doesn't mean you're a lesser person. It just means that your arms aren't as long as Carl is. Three breaths. Good. And keep that arm going behind you. Bend it like that. <laughs> My ingenious method. And then uh, bring your arms over your head and flip your palms. So I'm just going to teach you the sequence. And then your right arm is on top. So pick up your strap with your right arm if you can't clasp your hands behind your back. And drop the strap over your right shoulder. And then sweep the left arm around behind and clasp the hands behind your back. Or use the strap. Okay. And now as you pull the right arm sort of like slightly back, and if you can, you'd have the head that the arm in the middle of the head, and you push the head gently back into the arm to really kind of what it does is it locks the right lung. So the right lung gets really stretched here. And the left lung is more relaxed. And so you, know, you take deep breaths into the chest and it will expand and contract your left lung more strongly. So this is a therapeutic posture for asthma and bronchial disease and all kinds of like, it's very good for your lungs in other words. So try to feel that as you take those deep breaths, you're getting more breath into the left lung than the right. And keep moving that top arm back. The bottom hand should be pulling the top hand down rather than the other way around. And then inhale and exhale. Keep your hands like that if you can and fold forward and just hook your chin over your knee if you have the right sort of geometry in your body. And then push the knee down, stretch through your cervical spine. Keep pulling on the arms. And you would normally stay here for three to six breaths. Long exhales, pauses at the ends, optional. But we want to, I want to teach you the sequence first. So inhale, come up. Exhale, release the arms. Inhale, float the arms. Exhale, bring the hands to the floor in front of you, rock forward on the knees. Push the feet down, push the hands down, hop up. Jump back, Chaturanga. Or just step back, Chaturanga, that's all right. Then inhale, upward facing dog. Exhale, downward facing dog. Inhale, left knee forward, foot across. Exhale, right knee behind left, separate the heels, sit down. Use as much support as you need. Or if the bottom leg's straight, you do the other side. Will that foot go out anymore? Or is that? And then just block that. Sit down. Sit up. Is that right? Can you put your foot out? 
and then do the vinyasa in the hand. And then twist. And just do whatever you can do. Use your strap, bring your hands around your back. You can, if it's, if it's a real struggle for you, you can have the, the forearm on the top knee, pushing it down. So you've got to get used to setting up your strap for this. The inhales are normal length, the exhales are longer with banders at the end. Why won't it go up? <laughs> are you enjoying it? So this is good. Good, and then inhale, come back to center. So you want to just sit up higher, Julia, or make it accessible. If it's really too much of it, if it's painful, then don't do it. Do do Arnab, do spinal twist, a normal Ardhametsi and Drasana. And then continue with the strap over the, or the hands clasped behind the back. Yeah. That's fine. If you can just hold that, that's fine. It's going to help. It's going to, it's a good posture. This is an incredible posture for your ankles, your hips and your knees. Do it, put it in your top hand so you drop it over. Yeah. Try to feel the difference in the lungs. And when you've done the three breaths, fold forward. And we'll just hold that for two breaths. The eyes closed. When you go down, look nabby, navel. When you finish your two breaths, you inhale, come up, release the hands, sweep them over your head, interlock your fingers, bring your hands down and then step back or you can hop back from here eventually and lower to Chaturanga. Move through the half vinyasa and come to down dog. And then come into a kneeling position, sit up. Okay, so just come to a kneeling position. So any questions about that posture? I mean, you all gave it a fairly good go, I thought. It's like, um, but for some people, it just isn't a suitable posture. Like if, if it's too much for your hips or your knees, you don't go there. So if you look at the sheet, which you obviously study most nights before you go to bed, there's, um, you'll see there there's the options of the straight legged spinal twist. The Ardhamatsi and Drasana, which we've been, up, been doing up till now, where you're kneeling, go to one side, bring the foot over. So that's the second option, which some of you are, would be better definitely doing those two poses and you know who you are. And then, but if you can sit in this position and get the feet, at, it's a really, really incredible posture for the flexibility and health of the knees, ankles and hips. And it's also recommended when you can sit in it comfortably as a posture for pranayama and meditation. And um, I've never been able to use it for pranayama, but I used to use it for meditation. When you get used to sitting in it, it's like really, really comfortable. And the, when you're doing it for pranayama, there's a slight tweak that you do um, so that when you do it for pranayama, you sit like this. And then instead of having the foot out, which is more of an asana, you bring it in to turn it into a mudra. And when you sit back, you, you put the heel in the anus. You have to find the anus. And then you kind of like sit like that. And that stimulates the energy in the Sushumna Nadi. So when you're doing your pranayama, you've got the heel um, right in the pressure point for stimulating the prana. And that's really quite comfortable when you get used to it. 
it's easier than some of the other cross leg positions where the heel goes into the perineum, in my opinion. But it depends on the person. Um, but if you and then the, the shoulder thing is like the way that isolates the lungs is the reason that you do that. Um, also, obviously, it's good for the flexibility of your shoulders, but the effect on the lung is really powerful. So when you really stretch, um, like, say, the left lung, then that, it really makes the right lung work more strongly. And that's why it's used in therapeutic practice. But it's also just very good for your general health of your lung tissue and the alveoli makes them really kind of work. Yes. So it's worth remembering and it can be useful for you or anybody you know who might need that kind of help. So um, there's another really nice way, place to do that is when you do your straddle forward bends, you know, you know, with feet apart and you're folding forward over the legs. And if you do the hands clasped behind version and then repeat it and do the other side, it really works well there when you're turned. So you're kind of inverted when you do it. Make sense? as opposed to this way you're sitting up, but then you invert, that changes the effect on the lungs. Okay, he looks suitably bored, so shall we move on? <laughs> okay, bring your hands to the floor, step back to down facing dog. When you're ready, take a long exhale. Hop a step forward. Ukkatasan. Separate the knees, sit down, Dandasan. Inhale, bring the arms over the head. Exhale, don't move. Inhale, come down onto your back, arms over the head. Exhale, hands beside the hips. Inhale, raise both legs 90 degrees. Exhale, squeeze both knees down to the chest. Fully empty, empty the lungs. Squeeze them down with your hands. Inhale, feet to the ceiling, hands to the floor. Exhale, heels to the buttocks, knees and feet together, feet on the floor. Hold the ankles or the heels or hands on the floor. Inhale, lift the hips up. Move the sternum towards the chin. Exhale down. Inhale up. Pause. Exhale down. Inhale, extend the legs to the ceiling. Exhale, don't move. Inhale, lift into shoulder stand. Or half shoulder stand. Or come to the wall and use the wall. Exhale, bend the knees towards your forehead or bring your feet into plow. Move your elbows closer and rock your shoulders under. And then come into a comfortable inversion for you, half or full shoulder stand, and establish your breath. Release the marmas. Close the eyes and look down into the back of the throat. Keep your throat relaxed. Make sure the tongue's relaxed. The upper palate and the soft palate relax. Just put your hips up on here. Lift up a bit, a bit more. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Your face should be totally relaxed. Your exhale longer than your inhale. You're looking down through the center of your head into the back of your throat. Good, then exhale and just bring your feet straight down into plow.
Keep your hands on your back. And inhale, come back to shoulder stand. And now I'm going to give you an option. You can do Niralamba, Tavangasana. So if you're comfortable there, you can release one hand and extend it up beside your thigh. And then release the other hand and extend it up and balance on your shoulders. This is full shoulder stand. Or you can bring your feet back over now and take three breaths and plow or with the knees towards the forehead. You choose. <laughs> yeah, okay. And then if you're in full shoulder stand, see if you can keep your arms in full shoulder stand and slowly lower your legs into plow. It takes a lot of balance, so be careful if you don't feel safe, bring your hands to the floor. Good plow. And then you keep your hands extending up and interlock your fingers and turn your palms towards the ceiling. Take an inhale. And as you exhale, thread the needle of your arms with your legs. And come down. You had them behind your bum. They're going to be <laughs> over your legs. No, I don't know anyone could do it like that. <laughs> oh, you're doing the same. Okay, now thread the needle, come down. Or now make your way down onto your back and do a variation of fish pose. So do, if you just all sit up when, you, when you're down, sit up, do a variation of fish pose. So you do it in Badakanasana, bring the soles of the feet together and the knees wide. Good, and then just hold the feet for a second and kind of like get your knees as far as they comfortably go. Then bring your hands behind you 10 inches. Push down into the hands and puff your chest up and squeeze your shoulder blades together. Take a couple of breaths deep into the heart so you're counterposing the chest. And then on an exhale, if you're comfortable with it, just drop your head right back. Look at the tip of your nose. Take deep breaths into the heart and a little pause in the breath at the end of each inhale. Uh, simple counter pose you can do for shoulder stand. The feet can be, you can have the legs in full lotus here as well, and there's other variations you can do. That's great. And then walk yourself forward and just fold forward over your legs, keeping your feet in Badakanasan or lotus. And then when you're ready, inhale and sit up. And exhale, come onto your back. And I'm relax. Switch off your J breathing and just let your body breathe. Relax your feet, calves, knees, hips. Let your legs go heavy. 
Relax the lower back and the upper back. All your spinal muscles. Relax your back. Intestines and stomach. Liver. Kidneys. Heart. Completely relaxed. Left lung. Relaxed. Right lung. Relaxed. Just let the body breathe. Fingers, thumbs, palms. Arms and shoulders. Relax the throat and the mouth. Relax the jaw. Relax the left eye. Relax the right eye. Relax both eyes, temples, forehead, scalp. Relax your whole physical body and all your facial muscles. And then drop your mind into your heart. Find the place where the breath begins and where the breath returns to. Rest your awareness there and completely relax. Deep in your breath. Feet together, arms by your sides. Inhale, arms over your head. Give yourself as a stretch and then make your way into seated position for pranayama. <clears throat> left hand Vishnu, right, uh, left hand Chin Mudra, right hand Vishnu Mudra. Close the right nostril with the thumb, exhale through the left. Inhale left, nose tip, third eye, soft palate, navel, perineum, retain, look hot. Exhale right, no sound. Stretch that breath out there. Inhale right, look nose tip, third eye, soft palate, navel, perineum, retain, look hot. Exhale left.
Inhale, left nose to third eye, soft palate, navel, perineum, retain, look hard. Exhale, right. Continue in your own time. Next time you exhale to the left nostril, release the hand and keep still. Feel the quality of your breath and your mind. Bring your hands into Anjali Mudra. Inhale, Devi Om. Om. Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha. Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha. <coughs> Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha. Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha. Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha. Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha. Om Tum Tukai Namaha. Om Tum Tukai Namaha. Om Tum Tukai Namaha. Om Dum Tukai Namaha. Om Dum Tukai Namaha. Om Dum Tukai Namaha. Om Him Mahalakshmi 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 Namaha. Om Maim Saraswati 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 Namaha. Om Namashivaya. 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 Oh. Om Triambakam Yajamahe Sugandim Pushti Vadanam Ovaru Kami Vapandanat Pritcho Mukhi Mamrita Hatha Om Lam Vam Ram Yam Ham Om
Om Bulu Sakrus Bhagavan Ki Jai. Remind yourself the intention you make your practice. <clears throat> Oh, namaste. namaste. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I have to tell you some things. Oh, yeah, I've got loads and loads of spider plants if anybody wants any. Don't all jump at once. So, you know, about this is my friend Gaina, who just seems to have a factory, spider plant factory. As you, as you go out, about to go out through the back gate to the left there in front of the, the end past the greenhouse, you'll see they're all on the floor there. There's loads of them. So it just if you want any or you know anything anybody wants, <laughs> just take them, please take them. Like I, I, I do it to save her, her from her addiction. I'm kind of a dealer in a way. It's like every now and again, we just get, she just rings me up and says, I've got so many solar plants, you've got to take them. This is her outlet. So if you want them, take just help yourself, take as many as you like. Um, and then we have, um, I can feel the battery coming on, like the Durga energy, Mother Nature beginning to close down a little bit, the leaves turning, all the sap and the energy being drawn back in. And that's how this time of year, that's what we are kind of like starting to think about and starting to feel, you know, because we're all connected up with that prana. So that's why we have Navratri now, Navaratri now, and that's on Sunday, earlier time, 5.30, not six o'clock. Um, and we'll do the worship to the Divine Mother. And then we have, we're starting at the end of satsang now to have Chai Chat, which is where I say I, I mean Marion makes chai. <laughs> and like, I'm too bad. So yeah, so we'll have chai and then we have a discussion. And I will, I give the topic for the discussion. I do a little reading or something. And the topic for the discussion is, oh, I've forgotten. Uh, the topic for the discussion is uh, the, mother, the mother goddess, um, uh, mother nature. The, the connection of the mother goddess, Durga, and mother nature. And the abundance, I think I put something like the benevolence of mother nature. So I'll be talking around that subject. That's the idea. Okay? If you want to come, just let me know, or there's a cheat. You can sign up in the back there if you want to. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Dum Durga Namaha. Jai Ma.